Hello everybody, welcome to Chin Fat. Uh, today what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be going over how to set up uh, cameras. I'm gonna go through everything uh, from f-stop to shutter speed to color temperature, uh, ISO, a whole bunch of different things, talking about how to manually set up uh, almost pretty much any camera. Uh, when I say any camera, I'm not really talking about phones necessarily, phone cameras, unless you have a pro mode. And a lot of phones do have pro modes where you can go in and actually can, you can switch it to pro mode where you can actually go in and change uh, shutter speed and color temperature uh, manually. But phones are pretty much automated, so people who don't know how to r r run cameras can pretty much pull out their camera and take pictures with that and get like a nice exposure and whatnot. But yeah, so we'll be talking about exposure, we'll be talking about lenses, we'll be talking about just camera basics. What I've got here is I've got a couple uh, Sony cameras uh, set up, uh, Sony 65. 400, Sony 6600 that will be demonstrating kind of the, uh, but, but even though these are Sony's, you can use this almost on any sort of camera. You just can't, it, it might be a uh, slightly different uh, nomenclature within the menu settings, but, uh, but all, all the setup is pretty much the same as far as, yeah, ISO, shutter speed, all those things that I've, I've been mentioning. So, and I'm shooting with a C2, uh, C200, uh, C200 uh, Canon camera right now. Uh, so I've got that going, I've got these two Sony's, and I've got my lovely assistant over here. Uh, the lighting kind of sucks right now because uh, she's my lighting technician. She's been slacking off, so we'll give her a break. Uh, anyway, let's jump into this. To get started, we kind of want to start talking a little bit about light, how light works. And you'll see here on this little picture that I've got going here, you got this little, uh, what would call, be considered a point of light. This point of light, basically, uh, when you have a hole inside of a camera, this is going to be representative of, of what we call an aperture inside your camera. But if you have a black box, it's kind of interesting where the word camera comes from. Uh, the word camera actually in Italian means room. And if you ever hear camera, camera obscura, that means dark. Obscura uh, means dark, and it is basically a dark room. If you ever see a camera obscura, a camera obscura is one of those uh, rooms that you can walk into that has like a, they can put a pinhole in it. And any image, any light that comes through, that comes through a little pinhole like this, a small opening, the, you can see the light beam from the top of the candle here uh, goes through the hole and it hits the bottom down here. And then you see that the bottom, the light that's reflecting off the bottom of the candle uh, goes through this goes through this pinhole and hits the uh, hits the top portion. It basically reverses the image, the, the light coming through the cam through that pinhole is basically create, creating an upside down image inside of this dark room. So here, what I've got is, uh, this is inside of our studio. We've got a little hole back here and a little screw hole that's the, where the screw is missing right there in that little hole right there. And uh, light is shining from the outside. And uh, right now, this is unfocused light. I've got kind of a white bounce board here uh, for that light that's coming through. And you can see the sky is on the bottom. We've got blue sky, it just snowed outside. So we've got uh, snow that's on the top. You can see the sidewalk there. But this is unfocused light. It's not focusing the light perfectly on this image plane that we've got right here. So that is where lenses come in. This is a little concave piece of glass right here. It's got some uh, bending uh, glass right there. This is actually like a zoom adapter for a camera, this is, but it does have a lens that helps like uh, double the, the zoom on or something. I can't remember what this one does, but this is helpful to kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about with that light. If I put that lens up in front of this hole here, you can see that it is now focusing that light on this plane here, and you're getting an image that's more in focus. Now you can see this guy. This isn't a perfect focus because I need to, the distance. I'm kind of uh, constrained by the distance I can converge to the lens here or move the lens back and forth here. But that right there, you can tell that is way more in focus than if I do this. That's way out of focus, and that is getting to be a little bit more acceptable in focus. You can see the sky, you can see the sidewalk, see the snow, upside down image as it comes through this pinhole. And it's not even a pinhole, it's kind of a large hole. It's like this uh, like half inch hole in the wall there. It's like shining this light through, but it, the light comes in and it creates that upside down image and put a lens in front of it and helps to focus it on that image plane. You have more of an image that's in focus. So kind of a little demonstration on how cameras work there. So a lens is a, is a device uh, that helps to focus, that helps bend that light and get it in a perfect focus point on the image plane. We're going to show you what we're talking about there as we get into depth of field. So first thing we want to talk about is depth of field. Now depth of field uh, is referencing the, the distance in front of your camera. If you think of some the, the light hitting your camera in a perpendicular fashion here, uh, it's going to be measured as distance between what is in focus and your, and your image plane here. Uh, so depth of field is how much is in focus in front of your camera based on distance from your image plane here. 
So let's say we're, we're traveling out from our image plane here. This is what's capturing the light and recording your image back inside the camera. In a film camera, that would be the film that's uh, going through the camera. Or if you're using a digital camera, that's going to be your image sensor inside the camera that the light is uh, being focused on. Now, if we go out in front of the camera, if we uh, travel out from this and we move out and we say, let's say this is, I don't know, let's say this is like five feet away from your image sensor. And then this here is eight feet. And let's say the sharpest point of light there that we're trying to focus, uh, that's called your focal plane. That's where the LED point of light is that's shining and spreading out light. And then this, uh, this lens here is bending it and hitting your image plane in perfect focus there. And that is your focal plane. Well, and now as we travel out here and uh, we go to, and let's say this is maybe like, let's say this is five feet, this is six feet, and then this is eight feet back here. So five feet out. Uh, is where your image appears to start being in focus and then this is the perfect point of focus here and then as we go past that uh, we, we, we start going out of focus again at eight feet. That means our, our depth of field is basically three feet. We have three feet that is in focus. Now there are several th things that can, uh, three major items that can affect your depth of field that either makes that widen out, become larger, or becomes more narrow. We're gonna use the terms deep and shallow. Shallow means you have very little depth of field, have a very uh, uh, narrow depth of field, and deep means you have a lot of depth of field. That means that, that, that a lot is in focus. Now, when it comes to things like phones, if you look at your uh, your phone, uh, those tend to have very, very deep uh, depth, uh, very deep depth of, fo uh, depth of field, uh, which basically, so, so people don't have to sit there and mess with the focus, they just wanna take pictures and have everything uh, look like it's in focus and have the exposure be good. Uh, uh, so therefore, therefore, they do make those uh, those cameras have a very deep depth of field uh, for that. If you want to get inside the, some of those phones, you can mess with the depth of field a little bit to, uh, to an extent. But most phones are automated just for, for con uh, general consumers. Now what we have back here, this is called the circle of confusion back here. What was basically meant by that is that the light that is hitting, uh, uh, that comes out of this point, you look at this point right here, and that comes out and then, uh, and then converges right there perfectly on the image sensor is going to be perfectly in focus. That is what's perfectly in focus. Now, as you start traveling out from that point here and you start moving away, uh, well, let's take this for an uh, instance. Here's your focal plane. Let's say that's six feet in front of the camera, this or in front of the, the image sensor, and this is five feet. And at five feet, a point of light here hits, and look where this converges. It converges back here. So this light here, when it hits the sensor, is spread out over a larger area, and therefore it appears to be out of focus. It's basically that light spreading out over a large area is what creates uh, something, what makes something out of focus. Uh, here at eight feet, you'll notice this line uh, hits the lens and it comes to converge it's right here in front. And then the light continues to spread out past that point there. And you have a large area of light that is out of that would appear to be out of focus. But our eyes can't really tell what's in and out of focus to a degree. That area that is that goes from here, basically as you go from the image plane to this point and to this point, if this perceived to be in focus, this light here, it, it's basically the circle from here to here is basically called the circle of confusion. That is what is technically out of focus, but we can't tell until it starts getting really out of focus that that light is out of focus. We call it an acceptable focus, uh, focus range. So once again, this image plane is where you have perfect focus and then things start going out of technically out of focus, but they appear out of in focus. They appear in focus to us up to a certain extent behind and in front of the focal plane. With, de with depth of field, what you basically get is this sort of look here. If you have, this is a shallow depth of field here. And the shallow depth of field basically, it makes the audience kind of concentrate on a very specific part of, of, your, of your image. And we kind of look to this locker right here specifically and everything else is out of focus. So our depth of field here starts about right there and ends about right there. Maybe that's about, I don't know, four inches of depth of field. That's a very shallow depth of field. And we're gonna talk about what you can do to manipulate your depth of field. So now that we know how you define depth of field, let's talk about what changes your depth of field. Three major factors here, you have aperture, you have focal length, and you have distance from camera. And we're going to show how each one of these affects your depth of field. And I will put the link to this depth of field simulator inside the description so you can go down there and take a look at it. Under this depth of field simulator, we have our focal length, we have our f-stop, which is basically uh, pertaining to the aperture, which we're gonna talk about here in a little bit, and then you have uh, your distance from the camera. And you notice down here, you've got this distance of your depth of field where you have this acceptable in focus. You can kind of see that uh, simulated up here that the background is out of focus and the subject is in, the, uh, is in focus. But we're showing how much depth of field there is. 
And this is uh, measured in meters right here. You can change that to feet if you want to. But it shows the total depth of field is 1.55 meters, and it's in focus from uh, 6.0 uh, meters to 7.57 meters. Uh, now that will change based on our focal length. This is when you zoom in and out. As you zoom in to this person here, the depth of field, look at how it gets muddier in the background and it gets more shallow. We're going to use the terms shallow and deep to, de to describe uh, a lot of depth of field deep, very little depth of field shallow. So this is very shallow right here and as we zoom out, the depth of field becomes deeper and we have more depth of field. As you change your iris here, your iris size, as you s stop down, which is actually making your iris smaller, uh, your aperture smaller, you get a deeper depth of field. As you open up your iris, make it w uh, more open, uh, it is becoming more shallow. Now distance as well, as you get closer to the camera, you have a shallow depth of field. As you get further away, you have a deeper depth of field. And that's all. And I love the simulator because it really shows, uh, based on your settings here, uh, based on the camera, the lens, different types of uh, uh, image sensor size, you can hold, enter all those values in and you, it will demonstrate your depth of field and what's happening there. Now a lens uh, works very much like the lens in our eyes and, and the aperture works very much like our pupils in our eyes, kind of a, the, the iris in your eye expands and, and contracts and relaxes and uh, changes the amount of light coming in and uh, as your iris opens way up, you're going to have less depth of field, uh, less will be in focus and as it, uh, as, it, as it gets smaller, you'll have a deeper depth of field and same as distance. If you bring your hand up, we don't have a zoom lens in our eye, we have what would be considered prime lenses, meaning that they can't uh, zoom in and out, they don't change uh, focal length. The depth of field shrinks as they get close, uh, further away. If you take your hand and put it in front of your face and get it closer and you focus on your hand, things in the background appear to be out of focus. So the depth of field is shrinking as things get closer to your eyes. And, the, uh, and lenses are based on how our eyes work. Uh, in fact, you have a piece of glass that's basically like the lens in our eye and you basically have uh, the aperture, which is basically our pupil in our eyes. Uh, the iris in our eyes uh, that, that opens, uh, that, that contracts and uh, relaxes and opens it up and closes it. So the things that affect up the field, let's first of all talk about aperture, what an aperture is. We've got a couple different things here. Photographers, I think, like to call this the diaphragm. In film, we tend to call it the iris more. Uh, so this physical mechanism that opens up and closes is called uh, your iris. And every lens is going to have basically an iris in it that opens up, makes it more open, and opens up what's called your aperture, measured by the, by the diameter here of this opening. Uh, that is what your aperture is. And that's usually uh, expressed in millimeters. So if it's opened up to maybe like 25 millimeters, that will be the distance of this aperture here is 25 millimeters and this may be, I don't know, like uh, like six millimeters or something like that. But that, that's essentially how these work and then as you open it up or stop down, it's going to let more or less light in. And that's going to affect your depth of field. When your uh, aperture is opened up, as we showed on the depth of field calculator, the depth of field uh, simulator there, your depth of field shrinks. And when it is down and letting very little light in, your depth of field is very, very deep. It gives you a lot of depth of field. Next is focal length. Focal length is basically de defined by the distance of your, uh, of, of your lens, essentially, from your image sensor, what is called uh, your focal point, where the, where the light is actually coming to a perfect point on your, on your image sensor there. So the distance, once again, expressed in millimeters, and it's actually not just uh, from the lens, but it's what's called the optical center of the lens, where the light actually begins to bend uh, inside that lens. From that, that is called the optical center of the lens, and that distance from the optical center of the lens uh, to your image sensor is going to be your focal length. And your focal length basically is, uh, it, you can think of this as zoom. As you take, a, if you have a, what's called a variable focal length uh, lens, your, the, this piece of glass will actually be pushing further away from the lens or closer to the, or will be pushing further away from the image sensor or closer to your image sensor, which is going to cause your camera to zoom in and out essentially. So this is basically a zoom lens that I have on this camera here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, this goes from what's called 18 millimeters to 135 millimeters. That means it's eight, right now it's at 18, which means it's 18 millimeters away from the image sensor in this camera, uh, the, the, the lens is. And as I grab this and, I'm, and I push it forward, this actually physically pushes the lens out. Sometimes it, so if they're big expensive lenses, sometimes you will not see that lens pushing out like that. Uh, because it's, it's all built within the housing and there's a piece of glass sliding back and forth or a series of glass pieces that are inside there. So I'm, uh, if we look inside the camera here, you can see what's happening as I zoom in. Uh, this is getting, it appears to be getting closer. It's sending that thing, it's sending the lens further away and that is basically zooming in. And if you bring it closer to the camera, you're getting what's called a wide angle shot there. And once again, that's expressed in millimeters. This, this is like 50 millimeters away from the 
uh, from, from the image sensor, then that, that will be a 50 millimeter lens. And if it's a set focal length, then that's going to be called a prime lens as opposed to a zoom lens. Primes means it cannot change focal length. If you want to get it closer to somebody, you have to either get a different focal length lens or you have to get, or you have to get closer to the subject. And there's some reasons for using, uh, for using prime lenses. Prime lenses tend to uh, be less expensive for the same quality of glass because there's less mechanisms in the lens. And also uh, they tend to open up a lot more and you can get a more shallow depth of field. Uh, cinema, when they really want that, uh, that shallow depth of field, they usually go to prime lenses. So f-stop, you hear f-stop thrown around. F-stop, a lot of people just think that refers to the aperture. It is not just the aperture. It is uh, it's a relationship between the focal length and the aperture. So basically focal length is how far your lens is zoomed in or out, how close it is to your image sensor, and then aperture is that diameter of the opening that's letting light in. So where we get f-stop from, that is a number basically uh, that talks about stops of light. Every time you increase uh, the amount of light coming into your camera, when you double it or cut it in half, that is considered a stop of light. You're either doubling the amount of light or cutting it in half. And we're going to talk about three different ways of changing your exposure, changing how much light is coming into your camera, and one way is aperture. So aperture basically, let's, like I mentioned, if you have like a 25 millimeter diameter and you have a 50 millimeter lens, your f-stop comes from this relationship of how far away your, your lens is. It's how many times you can fit that aperture within your focal length basically, which is uh, expressed in this uh, equation here, focal length divided by aperture. So let me kind of demonstrate that a little bit in a drawing here. If we have our lens here, and we have our image sensor back here inside the camera, and that light is coming in and hitting the image sensor, as we mentioned, bending and, and, hit, and focusing on the image sensor here. Now, um, your focal length, your focal length divided by aperture here, let's say your aperture is uh, 20, let's, let's say the distance in our focal length is 50 millimeters uh, from the optical center of the lens to the image sensor. Now, if you have an aperture that's open 25 millimeters, that basically means you're going to be able to fit 25 millimeters. That's not a great drawing there. Let's bring the image sensor closer. There we go. So uh, that means you can basically fit that uh, aperture size in here two times. Uh, if, you, if you turn it on its side and look at it this way, you can fit it two times. So that means our f-stop is 2.0. If you have an f-stop of a uh, standard f-stop of like 5.6, that means you can fit at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then a little bit more than a half of a circle there, 5.6 times within that, uh, within your focal length there. And that's basically where they come up with. So a larger number, like an f11, you can fit it 11 times, means you're going to have a little small hole, and a, like a 2.0, you're going to have a very open hole. So, so yeah, your aperture will be very open, and here it is uh, closed down, not letting as much light in. So let, let's talk about a stop of light, because when we talk about f-stops, uh, there's a standard f-stop scale that's used by cinematographers quite often, and that standard f-stop scale is basically based on stops of light. So a stop of light is basically when you double your light or cut your light in half. If you cut it in half, exactly, that's you decrease it by a stop. If you double the amount of light hitting your image sensor, that's increasing, increasing it by a stop. Now, this is a standard f-stop scale. You'll see these on cinema lenses where each stop represents a stop of light. Uh, 1.0 is going to be very, very open, and then you go to 1.4, and that's going to, you just cut your light in half. If you go to 1.4 to 2, you just cut your light in half, and so on. If it do, does the same, if you go in reverse from, or go in the reverse direction here from F22 to F16 to F11, you're doubling uh, when you go from each stop. That's what these, this standard f-stop scale is for. This is a measurement of that light, uh, mathematically, to show how much light you're letting into your camera. And each stop, like I said, is going to double or cut your light in half. Now, one thing that you're doing when you're changing the uh, changing your aperture size is you're letting a certain amount of light in, which changes the exposure. And we'll go, we'll get into talking about and we'll get into talking about exposure uh, if you're overexposing or underexposing your shot. But we're talking about it in terms of depth of field right now. Uh, so you can see that we've got a 1.8 down here an F4 and an F8 right here. Uh, and you can see that this uh, image is in focus in each one of the shots, but you'll notice the background, and the background is out of focus in each one of these shots. But you notice as you go from F8 to 1.8 here, so this is a smaller hole, this is very open, our shot is getting muddier and muddier. That's what they, they call this muddy as it gets more and more out of focus like that. And down here, so it doesn't overexpose, they're changing their shutter speed here. to uh, Shutter speed being another type of exposure, which we'll talk about. The three types of exposure that you can control are going to be your aperture or your f-stop, your shutter speed, and then ISO, which is sensor sensitivity, and we'll, we'll get into that. So you can see what's happening to the depth of field here. You've got a very muddy background, and you have an out-of-focus background, but not quite as out-of-focus as this, just by changing, simply changing your aperture size. 
Focal length I demonstrated inside the camera as the lens travels further away from the camera, you get, uh, you zoom in basically. You can see like we've got an 18 millimeter. This is 18 millimeters away from the image sensor. The glass is now 300 millimeters further away from the, from the image sensor and it zooms in. Uh, so you can see we got it zoomed out and then it goes all the way to zoomed in here. The way you can kind of think about that is imagine you're inside of a train tunnel and there's a tree outside or even a cave or whatever, mine shaft, who knows, uh, something creepy where you're trapped inside. Okay, so let's say you're here or you are here. From right here, when you get closer to this opening here, you're going to see a lot more of the perspective changes and you're going to see a lot more of this tree. As you start moving down this way, you start getting more of what would be considered a telephoto point of view. This is considered telephoto and this is considered wide angle here. So, so when you're seeing uh, a more of the image that's considered wide angle, as you go down further down the train tunnel, you're only gonna, going to see a smaller portion there. So that's basically like zooming. And imagine you as that piece of glass moving back and forth away from your image sensor, and you would see more or less of the image. And you're changing your field of view, essentially. So focal length is also going to affect your depth of field. And the way that works, and we showed that in the depth of field simulator, uh, here you can see we've got the same f-stop on each one of these shots here. So that's not changing the depth of field because we've got f-16, f-16, f-16. But we've got a 60 millimeter lens, a 100 millimeter lens, and a 180 millimeter lens, and look what's happening to the depth of field. And what they're doing to get the same framing here is basically, uh, the, as, they, as they zoom in, they're moving the camera back further and zooming in to get the exact same framing. So the flower seems to be the same distance away from the camera, but look what happens to your depth of field. It makes your depth of field shallow as you zoom in. As you increase focal length, your depth of field decreases. One thing that focal length also does is that it, uh, it causes what's called space compression. It eliminates depth in the shot. It makes it feel like everything is so packed together. When you, the, the higher focal length you have, the more you zoom into something, the more you are going to have this effect where it looks like everything is just smashed together and you have really no sense of depth. And that can be used to a cinematic advantage. It's used in quite a bit of movies to make th things seem like they're closer. In fact, if we just look here at this, the, the shot, these images here, on uh, 18 millimeter versus the 55 millimeter, the 55 millimeter, you have less sense of depth. As you zoom in, you have less se sense of how much space is between objects. When you zoom out, you have a much better perspective as far, a much better perception of the distance between objects. And this is a little bit exaggerated here. As we zoom out, we start getting kind of this bulby effect here. As you get too wide, you'll start getting kind of this fisheye effect. Now this is an instance where focal length and space compression versus space compression causes what we call uh, you can use it for what's called forced perspective. This was used in Lord of the Rings quite a bit to make uh, where they put people that they wanted to look like they were smaller further away and people that want, want to look larger, they put closer together, then they'd zoom in and change the focal length to make it look like they were pushed together with a longer focal length lens. It made like people look like the hobbits look like they were smaller and, the, and then uh, taller people look like they were taller in the image. So here's an example of a longer lens and the longer lens looks that makes it look like objects are closer together. And then here, this is a wider angle lens, and we have more of a realistic perspective of distance between objects and subjects here. Now, as we mentioned, a prime lens is a lens that has a fixed focal length, and I just want to kind of demonstrate the difference between the, the price of these lenses. You can usually, uh, w whether you have equal quality glass in a, in a lens, there's a lot more components that go into a zoom lens to be able to make these, uh, these pieces of glass, and even mechanics as well. There's a lot more mechanics inside of a zoom lens. So advantages between using a prime lens and a zoom lens, one is price, and you can get the same clarity and the same quali good quality image with a uh, prime lens that you can with a zoom lens, uh, but but the zoom lens was going to be more expensive for the for the similar quality uh, of glass that you have inside in the lens. Uh, and also, prime lenses tend to be with it since it has such a lack of mechanics in it, they are able to have an aperture have a wider aperture which gives you more control over your depth of field with a prime lens than you do often with a zoom lens. Even an expensive zoom lens, oftentimes zoom lenses will start around like f4 where you can get prime lenses that go down to 1.4, 1.2, 1.0, in some instances 0.8 which is insane. It's an insanely open, wide, fast, fast lens that does really well in low light. All right, let's talk about shutter speed. Shutter speed is basically defined as exposure time, how much time it takes to expose a frame. So as we go through the different types of methods to expose your image sensor to light, uh, you do have, you have your f-stop, which is basically amount of light that's coming into your lens. Shutter speed is basically how long it's exposed for. We could just call this exposure time, how long each frame is exposed to light. And then we will talk about ISO here in a little bit. That's sensor sensitivity, essentially.
we're talking in terms of motion picture film, we are shooting oftentimes 24 pictures per second. They're called frames per second. Now, if you're doing that and you divide each one of these into 1 24th of a second, uh, that's basically how long you can expose each frame for is 1 24th of a second because you're shooting 24 pictures per second. That means each one could be potentially exposed for a maximum of 1 24th. Happens to be that film standard is 1 48th, which is divided in half. That's basically half, ex half exposure time uh, per frame. This became a standard because of the rolling shutter that's inside of a film camera. If you have a film strip going through a camera, you have what's called a rolling shutter, this little plate that rolls basically and moves in front of the film and blocks the light from coming in. And then when it's away from the film, it's exposing light onto the film and burning an image onto the film. Now, once it takes a picture, this thing is constantly rolling and uh, you have little sprocket holes on the film and the gears pull these, this film down. While this thing is over the film like that and blocking the light, that's when the sprockets pull down the film and pull it down to this next frame and puts that next frame right here. And then it rolls around and it exposes the film. And then when it's closed, it's, uh, that's when the film is moving through. And because of the very mechanics of the film, it could only be exposed at a maximum of 1 48th of a second at 24 frames per second. They call this actually 1 48th of a second is the same as this is called a shutter angle here. Uh, that angle is 180 degrees for exposure time. So that equal, so they call that a 180 degree shutter angle. Because uh, this is actually two plates right here, and on a film camera, they can change the angle. But it's got two plates together, and you, as you change it, it rotates one plate out. So basically, this would become now a 90-degree shutter angle. So this is all this black plate that's blocking light from coming in. But now it's exposing it for one quarter of, of the time. That's basically 196 shutter speed there, which be the, the equivalent of a 90-degree shutter angle. Now, shutter speed does a couple different things. First of all, it exposes for a certain amount of time, and uh, that, that is, uh, that will determine how overexposed or underexposed or properly exposed your image is. But it also does this. The longer you leave your shutter open for, and if there's movement in front of the camera, you're gonna have this, this streaky, blurry stuff going on. So this is a slower shutter speed. This is a faster shutter speed. The, the, picture, the, the camera opens up the shutter and closes it. Uh, now, in a, lot of, um, in a lot of still photography cameras, if you look at like a DSLR, let's talk about a DSLR camera that's, uh, or, or an SLR camera, the digital SLR or an SLR single uh, lens reflex camera, uh, you've got uh, basically this shutter that uh, you have your image sensor back here or the film back there. Uh, the shutter basically pops open here uh, this is a mirror, by the way. That mirror basically sends light through if it, this is an SLR, and then uh, the light bounces off that mirror, goes up to another uh, mirror, or uh, up to another mirror, and then it points out to the eyepiece right there. And that light is actually hitting your eye, and you're actually looking at the light that's coming through the camera. So, but this uh, mirror here actually acts as a shutter as well. This mirror will open up, it'll pop open, and then it will, then the light will come in and hit the sensor, and then that will close. And then the time that it does that in is called your shutter speed. It opens up and closes. If it opens up for like a half a second, that's your shutter speed is one half of a second. But the higher the shutter speed, so if you go like, let's say one one thousandth versus that, yeah, like one forty eighth, one one thousandth is going to have less movement in that one one thousandth of a second than one forty eighth. And therefore, if you have like in one forty eighth, if you have like a picture of, of like a bee buzzing across and, and in one forty eighth of a second, it goes from there to there, you're going to have just this blurry streak going from there to there. But if you in one one thousandth, this thing barely moves like hardly at all in that time while it's moving, one one thousandth of a second, you're going to have a nice crisp image of that thing looking like it's just hovering in, in midair with no movement. Because sometimes shutter speed is wanted, like if, if you want the desired effect of movement, that kind of looks natural. Otherwise, it looks like this guy here is just frozen in air. It's like Spider-Man clinging against that pillar behind him. So here you can see an example of a higher shutter speed. This is at 1 180th. Uh, and you have a little bit of motion blur, and then one, 100, one over 350, you have it like the bat looks like it's just, he's holding it there, and it, it decreases the, the what's called the, the motion blur. Here's an example of low shutter speed. Here's an example of high shutter speed. And those measurements uh, where we're cutting things in half, if we go like 1 48th and we go to 1 96, that's basically cutting your light down by one stop, and let's go the other direction to 1 24th. So 1 24th, this is increasing it by one stop, this is decreasing it by a stop as you, as you keep cutting your shutter speed in half. 
The last way of exposing your film, the third way I should say, is ISO. ISO, it stands for International Standards Organization. It's a standard that's been set up for sensor sensitivity. Uh, it's how sensitive um, a sensor is to light. And in, in nature, there's this exists as well. Like there are some animals that have a higher, I guess you could say ISO, well, sensitivity to low, to low light, like owls that can see really well in the, in the dark, better than humans can. So they have a better uh, ISO, I guess, a more sensitive, what, would it, what we would call in camera terms as a native ISO. ISO is measured by the, the standard that's been set up by increments of 100 here. And every time you double these numbers, as you go to 100 to 200, 200 to 400, uh, you're making your sensor more sensitive, 800, or 400 to 800. And this is actually increasing or decreasing your light by a stop by these measurements. Every time you double it or decrease it, uh, cut it in half, it's basically, these are increments that are increasing it, the sensitivity by one stop or decreasing it by one stop of light. So there are three ways to increase and decrease your stops. One is essentially by f-stop, one is by shutter speed, and one is by ISO. So these are three ways you have of controlling your image. Now in film there are typical standards uh, when they're shooting. The standards for this is going to be 180 degree shutter angle for shutter speed. For f-stop is usually it, it, between a four and five, six. Sometimes we'll say a four, five, six split is kind of the standard, standard f-stop. Some cinematographers might argue four, some might argue five, six is a perfect exposure. So some set will say a four, five, six split. And that just means halfway in between four and five, six is, the, is, a, is, a, is a standard exposure for film, for motion picture film. And then ISO standard shutter speed if you're shooting, if you're shooting indoors is going to be 800 and if you're shooting outdoors is going to be 200. If you're shooting outdoor, you're going to be getting 200. But let's talk about this in terms of digital cameras. If you have a native ISO of 800, what that essentially means is that your image, as you increase your ISO, let's say it goes 1600, then to 3200, and you keep increasing the sensitivity to 6400. As you keep going up, if your camera is at a native, 100, native ISO of 800, boosting this up, you're going to start introducing a lot more grain or noise into your image. The, the sensor was built for getting an optimal image around 800 or below. You can go lower than that, you're gonna get even a cleaner, cleaner image if you can get your eyes up, but this is going to require more light. So, but it guarantees you're gonna be shooting a good clean image at 800, and if you increase it, uh, you will start noticeably getting more and more grain, and you'll start losing color eventually as well. So if you look at this image here, you can kind of see as we get a higher ISO, this is probably around 800, I'm guessing this is maybe around 3200, depending on what camera you're using here. Uh, not built for low light, uh, then, then your image will start breaking apart. As you can see here, start getting more grain and noise in your shot. One last consideration here is going to be color temperature. Different lights have different color temperatures. If you're outdoor, you have more of a bluish light. If you're indoor under incandescent light, it tends to be a warmer light. And then you also have fluorescent, which is in between. And that's measured on what we call the Kelvin scale. The Kelvin scale kind of looks like this here, where you start on the lower end of the Kelvin scale around 1,000, you have very reddish, warm, orange light there. Uh, and as you move on up, you move into kind of the, the mid-range here, into kind of greenish area, and then you start moving into blue. And uh, daylight tends to look on cameras very bluish. We call it white light sometimes, but it tends to be very kind of bluish to cameras. Um, and then as you go higher, up to 10,000, there's very blue sky. But yeah, the, the, you'll see the Kelvin scale on, on these thousands here. Uh, but two major light sources that we work with in film are going to be indoor and outdoor light. Incandescent color temperature, which hits around 3,200. Uh, incandescent, oh look, they spelled it blobs, blobs, very nice. And then uh, daylight, not really that green, it's a little bit more on the bluish end of things, so the scale is a little inaccurate, but uh, it tends to be around 5600, so they kind of misaligned that as well, it should be over here a little bit more. So yeah, that'll be more towards the blue range, it'll start getting into kind of out of the green, kind of getting more, th this would actually be what daylight is looking like right around here, uh, to a camera. To us, it just looks, it looks like normal sunlight, but yeah, it wants, if you have your camera set for indoor light, it's gonna think there's a lot of warmth in the light, and you go outside, it's gonna look very blue because it starts pushing uh, blue into the shot to get rid of the, the warmth in the shot, to kind of balance it and make it look normal. All right, guys, that's about it. I just want to talk about some of the basics of cameras and lenses, talk about exposure, talk about, talk about a few ways of uh, exposing light to your camera's sensor, uh, also a few ways of affecting your depth of field and changing focal length, all those definitions and everything. So I have a part two to this as well. So if you want to watch that, it's going to show the, the setup on how to basically go inside your camera and change these things and set these to get a perfect exposure, uh, change your focus, get a perfect focus, uh, things like that. So yeah, stick around for the part two and thanks for watching.